to the Farnsworth Art Museum's lecture series. Uh, my name is Jude Valentine and I'm coordinator of studio and public programs here at the Farnsworth. And uh, before we get started in earnest, I wanted to mention that we'll be taking questions at the end of the program. So please feel free to put your questions as they come up during the slide talk into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And um, Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Fisher. Sarah was here in December, all virtually, and um, she gave a wonderful talk about taking care of Rembrandt. And included in that talk were some little tiny stories about her um, little, little teasers about how she was a courier. And so we thought we should have her back because that would be a fascinating talk. So she agreed. Um, so we're so pleased to have you back, Sarah. Um, just a brief bio uh, introduction. Uh, Sarah Fisher's conserv conservation career span, spanned 45 years. She has an undergraduate degree in art history and minored in studio art, starting her training in conservation in Italy, working on flood damaged paintings in Florence in 1967. She continued a self-designed apprenticeship education in Europe, studying in conservation programs in Stuttgart, Zurich, Amsterdam and Brussels before returning to jobs in the US in the Intermuseum Laboratory in Overland, Ohio and at the Balboa Art Conservation Center in San Diego prior to being hired by the National Gallery in 1981. There she was initially senior conservator of paintings before heading the department about 10 years later. She retired to Damascata with her husband in 2012 following years of visiting family in the area and she has taken up her own painting since then, creating new art rather than taking care of old art, the great icons of our culture. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for agreeing to, to uh, give a talk today. All right, thank you. Well, uh, greetings, everybody. It's so nice to be here with you today, especially because it was snowing this morning in Maine, and I'm hoping that you, uh, I can take you away to a slightly more exotic uh, climate and experiences and get away from the snow flurries. So this talk is about courier travel with art as it is sent to and from the wonderful museum exhibitions that we are usually used to being able to visit in normal non-COVID times. Arranging to have a courier, usually with the museum's own staff, travel with art uh, in transit is how museums and insurance companies have solved the problem of making sure that the art is safely handled and protected every step of the way during its exhibition travels. Remember that the art that I'm talking about is extremely valuable, worth multiple millions of dollars, um, or really of unmeasurable uh, cultural and historic value. Uh, here, for example, is the National Gallery's self-portrait by Vincent van Gogh, um, a wonderful image painted quite late in his life. And I uh, traveled with this painting to um, to uh, a, an, on a big exhibition to Japan, to Tokyo and Kyoto in 2011. Here is the brochure from that exhibition. I enjoy seeing Van Gogh uh, along with the Japanese um, script writing and the uh, American flag in the background. So it's, uh, it's um, fun to see uh, how much in this case the Van Gogh is appreciated in Japan. But anyway, um, so how is this courier travel done with these hugely valuable works of art? I'm changing a little bit the format of uh, how I tell this story from my original description in the museum's um, uh, online explanations about the talk. Rather than following a few specific paintings through the exhibition travel process, I'll start with the travel procedures themselves and give you a description of what's involved for a painting and for the courier as they move from their own museum to that of the distant borrowers and back again. And I'll use uh, 
examples, illustrations from my own experiences. My focus will be only on paintings and the role of the painting conservator as a courier, although um, of course there are many other uh, kinds of art that travel, sculptures, um, furniture, decorative arts, but I, um, as you heard from Jude, my background is a, a painting conservator at the National Gallery in Washington, the last 20 years of which I was head of painting conservation. Here's a view of our painting conservation department, the studio, and here's another view of some of my staff working away on their paintings. As Jude said, I gave a talk about painting conservation for the Farnsworth last December, so I'm not going to go into details of what museum-based painting conservators do. Um, just remind you that they are responsible for the care and the good condition of the paintings, no matter uh, whether they are on or off the premises of the collection. Another reminder is also that I'm just talking about national, my experiences at the National Gallery. The National Gallery is a very large, of course, and very well endowed museum. And uh, each many other museums may have their own practices and their own ways of doing th things. I want to emphasize from the start and have you remember that no matter how glamorous and adventurous the idea of traveling all over the world with works of art is, the core goal of the job is to make sure that the art arrives at its destination in the same condition as when it left its home museum walls. That's critical. But here is just a little, uh, some views of the glamour. That's, this is me uh, on the left at, in the lobby of our hotel in Kyoto, part of that courier trip to Japan. And here's a wonderful scene of a, a Kyoto street scene, which is such a charming city. However, away from this, uh, the little perks, the side perks of uh, courier trips, uh, the responsibilities are major and the government indemnity or other insurance that cover the paintings in any exhibition require that any artwork be watched every step of the way during packing, travel and hanging. So much, so much can do go wrong during transit. And the courier is really the guardian of the painting. It's dedicated protector to make sure nothing does happen. And here's just an image of the little palette uh, with our blue National Gallery crates on it. Uh, it's center, sort of center lower left being pulled by that little blue vehicle uh, about to be loaded onto a big um, airline. This is to go from Houston to Japan. Um, again, in the same show I mentioned. And somehow the little palette looks so alone out there on the tarmac, as you can imagine, it can get affected by bad weather, by careless handling. All these things are um, issues that the courier watches out for. Now I'll take you step by step through some of these courier procedures. To start off, once the idea for an exhibit as a, at a, a museum is solidified, the planners, the exhibition planners, send out requests to the museums owning the works to request the loans that they would like to have for their show. And then this loan request is either approved or not approved by the museum owning the works requested. At this point, the conservation department of the potential lending museum gets involved and is often asked, is the work that's requested in good enough condition to lend? Uh, for the example is usually yes, but sometimes it's no, in this case, I had to turn down uh, sort of the pressure of a request uh, to lend this, um, this beautiful early Rembrandt to, um, to a big exhibition in Europe. Uh, this painting is quite remarkable. It's, it's about three feet tall by two feet wide and it's on a single oak panel, a very thin oak panel. And it's in almost perfect condition. It's beautiful shape and I uh, had turned down the loan request and I got a call from our director asking us, uh, wouldn't you reconsider, this was back in the 80s, uh, reconsider the loan, we really want it to go to the show and I still couldn't agree to lend it because uh, no matter how carefully it was packed, it, it was just too special and fragile a painting to loan. So sometimes the answer has to be no. Um, the, and the, re the request might be turned down for other reasons. For example, the museum wants to keep the painting on display, doesn't want it to be away for too long or such things. Um, but we're most interested in these condition issues. Um, if the request is sent in early enough, then the conservation department in the owning museum might be asked to uh, conserve the painting and get it ready for the show. But, but 
um, if there's time enough, that can sometimes be, uh, can sometimes happen. At this time then, by this time, the registrar's department and the exhibition's department have gotten involved at the National Gallery. They make sure all the legal aspects of the loans are correct, that the loan contracts are okayed and signed by the borrower, and that all practical aspects of the uh, transporting the work and that the courier uh, arrangements have been made. And then finally, the painting is ready to come off the wall and start the trip. At this stage, the courier starts his or her work they must familiarize themselves thoroughly with the condition of the work before packing. So he or she closely examines the surface of the painting uh, to, to try to practically memorize uh, how the surface looks. So if there's any change when the painting gets to its um, destination, that, that can be noted. Here is an image of me actually not at the beginning of the trip, but at the when the painting has arrived at the destination and we are examining it after it was unpacked. But I like this image because it shows the ubiquitous head loop that we always wore to look closely at the painting. It shows our documentation. Uh, the courier always travels with paperwork on which they carefully note what they see on the surface. They're usually a photograph and a diagram in which um, the details of condition can be noted. And uh, then that documentation travels with the courier to the destination. So when the painting's unpacked, it can be compared uh, and the, the receiving uh, conservator can, um, can look at that and agree that that is correct. But I like this painting too, because this was at the Rijksmuseum. I was taking our beautiful Vermeer uh, woman holding a balance which is just an exquisite painting. And, and it's uh, of course, very rare and very uh, high value and a great uh, favorite with viewers at the National Gallery. So we don't let it off on loan very often, uh, but we did agree to have it go to the Rijksmuseum in the mid 1990s, I think. And uh, so here we are examining it after it's being unpacked and we're being watched. We were working in one of the galleries that housed the Rijksmuseum's Rembrandts and the famous late Rembrandt painting, the Syndix is watching us as we examine the painting. So I thought this would be a good slide to use. How um, the, uh, anyway, uh, moving back to the um, process now, we uh, jumping back to the beginning of the process. After the conservator, uh, the courier closely examines the painting, then the next stage is the packing of the painting. Packing is an art in itself. And again, I could talk for hours about packing, but essentially the paintings travel in a wooden or metal crate that um, has been built precisely for that painting. Um, padding reduces the shock and vibration of the transit as much as possible. Here is just a classic simple wooden crate with pads at the corners where the frame corners rest and double padding at the bottom. Uh, paintings in transit always travel vertically and um, uh, they travel, they are always packed in the vehicle in the direction of travel that it's been shown with much testing that there's less shock and vibration to the painting if it's traveling that way. So there's double double foam on the bottom of the crate. Here's, um, uh, oh, and I want to thank my former boss, uh, Merv Richard, the head of all of conservation at the National Gallery for letting me use some of his slides. He's an expert in art and transit and has given many lectures on them. So he had some great slides that I uh, have borrowed a few from. Um, after the paintings uh, or before the painting is placed in the crate, it's often wrapped in plastic, which is sealed with tape. This not only reduces the risk of moisture getting in to the actual painting, but it creates a buffer of conditioned air around the painting to slow down any sudden changes of temperature that might occur on the outside of the crate. Um, there are so many different types of crates to accommodate different types of paintings, but that what I showed you is just the basic design. Uh, Here's a, another image of a larger crate in the basement packing area at the National Gallery. Once the paintings uh, are packed in the crate, um, all watched carefully by the courier, um, the, and so the courier knows exactly what to expect when the crate is opened at the other end, then the um, next, the crate is uh, ready for its next step. 
The National Gallery's location in Washington, D.C., of course, greatly influenced the transportation arrangements. I realized uh, just recently after looking at this image that uh, this is before the, um, the, Air, the um, Indian Museum was built. Uh, over there, there's a large kind of in the center right, there's a large bare brown spot that is where the uh, the Museum of uh, the, for the Native Americans was built, and I this so this is a pretty old slide, but it gives you a great overview of the mall, the gallery, Capitol, and uh, Washington towards the east. Anyway, um, for transporting art, um, the best techniques are the fastest, the most control environmentally controllable means to get the artwork to its destination with the least uh, potential for damage, and that obviously means the most direct route and the simplest route. Years of experience and testing have shown that the best transportation method for art is by truck and airplane, which might surprise people. Here's a typical art moving truck. And uh, here's just a, a load. This is not art, but these are um, cargo. This is cargo being loaded into a big freighter plane. Rail travel uh, involves too much risk, too much irregular motion over long periods of time and difficulty with environmental controls and travel by boat is this, has the same problem, long travel times and no control over the environmental conditions around the crates. And now the Washington DC location of the gallery also meant that most of the gallery's overseas loans therefore had to travel uh, via Kennedy Airport uh, to Europe or, or internationally, anywhere. Dulles Airport is the largest of the DC area airports, but it just didn't have the extensive cargo facilities that Kennedy Airport has, as you see here. Uh, therefore, the first part of our courier trips was usually an early, early morning awakening uh, to get to the gallery by five o'clock to uh, see the paintings loaded into truck and then have a, usually a six hour trip by truck to Kennedy Airport. Um, uh, so we were just never too fresh on our arrival at the airport, and that was really just the beginning of the longer part of the trip. Critical for the safety of paintings on, in trucks um, are environmental controls. Going back to this image, uh, you can see that sort of an air conditioning system on the top of the truck and the ducts at the top of the truck to bring in uh, air conditioned air and heated air. And this is also a good example of the, how crates travel in a truck strapped against the walls very tightly with strapping and in the direction of, of transport. We also, it was essential to have good in, uh, environment, uh, good controls um, to reduce shock and vibration. So all the trucks that we uh, used for this kind of travel had air ride suspension. Mm -hmm. Loan requirements specified that there had to be two truckers on an art transport trip so that if something happened, there would always be one who could stay with the truck. The courier was also instructed to always stay with the truck. Uh, and the only exception, of course, was at a rest stop when the courier would take turns with the, with the drivers um, to go to the facilities or buy a sandwich. I've actually never heard of an attempt to steal art that was traveling by truck, uh, but the trucks are usually not identified as art uh, transport trucks just to be safe. I suppose the only times that I have been slightly worried about physical danger on a courier trip were, had nothing to do with art traveling in trucks, but were more due to outside circumstances. When I was in Barcelona in uh, 2012 for a large Miro exhibition, here's a classic, very surrealist abstract Miro from the National Gallery. Uh, this was the view outside the door of our hotel at the time. And actually it turned out that students were rioting uh, to, they were protesting austerity measures. The government was trying to reduce the amount of money that the government uh, gave to students for their, um, their university education. But here, in this case, the students were not trying to hurt people. They just wanted to draw attention to their concerns. So we didn't feel threatened. We just had to be careful about where we were walking. A, but. Uh, Another um, probably more worrisome problem was the big uh, Fukushima Shima Daiichi nuclear disaster that took place in 2011. The uh, big impressionist, post-impressionist exhibition uh, in which the Van Gogh traveled that I opened my talk with, that exhibition came to Tokyo just two months after this disaster had happened. 
uh, of course, all the plans had been made long prior to the disaster, but the gallery had to kind of scramble to um, and worried a lot about the arrangements. Uh, we as couriers were given the option of not going on the trip and uh, they would choose uh, couriers who would agree to go, but all of us decided we, in support of Japan, uh, also we wanted to go. And Tokyo was actually outside the 50 mile uh, radiation limit. So uh, we were not that worried about it, uh, but we were given docent radiation dosimeter badges to um, wear just in case. And uh, none of us had any exposure to radiation that we knew about. So back to our travel sequence, we have uh, now arrived by truck at Kennedy Airport. There at the cargo warehouse, we're met by our agent and the crates would be unloaded. This would be a cargo warehouse that um, was for the airplane uh, company that we were using. The crates would then be packed onto pallets of different sizes, depending on the number and sizes of the crates involved. Um, here you see the packing process of the forklift brings the big blue crate. I let me mention too that the National Gallery crates are always painted that blue, so you can identify them as my talk goes along. Um, then they are uh, tightly packed. Um, if one just had one or a few crates, as in this case, um, the crates had to share the pallet with a lot of other cargo and it was the agent's job and the courier's job to make sure that there was not any dangerous cargo um, that could cause trouble. Like, um, for example, I've seen uh, metal barrels of solvents uh, traveling on pallets and we, um, tried, we made sure to avoid anything like that. Uh, loading of pallets was a fine art. And as a courier, I've spent many long, often very cold hours in uh, where, uh, airport warehouses watching pallets being loaded. Once they were loaded, the contents would be wrapped in plastic, as you see here on the left, to shield it from moisture. And then the heavy netting is put over as the final step of the packing. It's drawn tightly with hooks underneath the edges of the pallets. That keeps the uh, load tightly constricted in place. The completed pallet is then weighed and moved either by forklift or tractor, um, either to be loaded pretty soon, like within the next two or three hours onto the waiting plane, or to be stored in a secure area overnight in the warehouse uh, for an early morning flight. Uh, after making sure that the pallet was securely stored, the courier would then be taken either to the passenger terminal to the gate or to um, the uh, airport hotel to be ready to be picked up usually again, three o'clock in the morning or so for the uh, trip the next day. Uh, here again, you see uh, the little, uh, the view of the uh, National Gallery pallets being taken to the lift to be lifted into the big flight uh, going from Houston to Tokyo. Sometimes the pallets, this is a, um, a regular passenger plane, the pallets are being loaded into the cargo hold of a passenger plane. Sometimes they'd be put into a combi plane, which was half cargo and half passengers. And sometimes they'd be put into a freighter plane when they were very large uh, and wouldn't fit into other um, sized cargo holds. When uh, the courier was traveling on a freighter flight, we would get to sit in a little cabin area just behind the pilot and the crew. Uh, and that was often fascinating. Uh, this is actually the slide that I found was very luxurious. Sometimes the, uh, the cabin area, this area for the couriers was not this glamorous. Usually the, the windows were sealed closed so you didn't have a good view outside. And we also had to usually the crew would show us how to get our own meals at that little kitchenette you see there in the, in the center. But this uh, image is interesting because it shows the open door and the ladder leading down to the cargo uh, hold area. Uh, we were not allowed to go down there, but um, I have traveled once with a courier who was a stable hand traveling with horses being uh, uh, shipped from Kentucky via New York to our European destination. And it interested me just because the courier uh, never was in her seat during landing or takeoff. She was always down with the horses. And she told me the horses are shipped in these aluminum containers that are like a mini stable, just large enough for the horse 
to be comfortable but not be able to move much. But she said that horses can easily panic during takeoff and landing and that she had to be down there to calm them down because it could be very dangerous if the horse reared up and its hooves could go through the aluminum side of its container and that would be disastrous for the flight. I uh, was always hoping that in this case, the art palette was not near the horse <laughs> containers. So the arrival at our destination airport was always pretty exciting. One hoped to have gotten some sleep during the flight to be able to face the complex procedures, which usually involve just the reverse procedures from what I've been telling you about. We would be met by our agent uh, as we got off the plane, taken to the warehouse to watch the uh, pallets being unloaded. Um, a forklift would take the crates to the museum truck waiting at the loading dock. We'd get on the truck and the cab and uh, tootle along to the museum and either watch the unpacking there or, or wait overnight for a pack, unpacking the next day. It was usually much more exciting to be arriving with uh, work at the beginning of an exhibition than, uh, than uh, going at the end because uh, usually the museum staff receiving uh, the work was much more excited uh, to see what was coming rather than uh, at the end of the exhibition when everything had finished. But examples of two different, uh, very different types of receptions that I've had uh, at the beginning of a show. Here uh, is an example of the wonderful facade of the National Gallery of London from Trafalgar Square. And um, the loading dock for the National Gallery in London is down around, way around uh, near the left edge behind the Sainsbury wing where you see that, that the newer wing is that the building at the left. And we'd, we would arrive with lots of <clears throat> crates late at night, quite tired, and there'd be a little bell on the outside of the loading dock. You'd ring it, a, a guard would uh, open up and check you out, and then, uh, and then some sleepy um, uh, art handlers would be there to, to help unload the paintings from the truck and would take them to secure storage there, and you'd check to make sure it was in good, a good, safe storage and then just leave that, that you hoped your truckers would take you to, to your hotel because it was usually after midnight. And then you wouldn't come and do any unpacking till the next day. So that, that was a rather kind of ho-hum type of arrival when the, um, because the museum, a large museum like this is used to doing so many huge exhibitions that it um, isn't, uh, they, they're pretty routine for them. However, a different sort of reception um, I had once in the, quite early in my career in 1983, when I was taking Juan Miro, the, the painter, the Spanish painter from Barcelona, uh, back to Barcelona uh, for an exhibition. The painting is a seminal work, uh, early work of Miro's. This is before he started that uh, surrealist style that you saw in the other painting I showed you by him. Uh, he had just gone to Paris and was excited by the abstract art of all the modern abstract movements, uh, cubism and all. And, and yet he painted this uh, semi-abstract view of a fa uh, the farm back in Spain near Barcelona. So I, um, the painting had belonged to Ernest Hemingway for many years since the 1920s, uh, but due to an ownership dispute between his uh, wives, his first and his fourth wife, it had not been available for loan for some years uh, and it had been hanging at the, our National Gallery for safekeeping uh, and for display while the legal issues were worked out. So I arrived in Barcelona by truck with the, uh, with the farm from Madrid, sort of sleepy again from the long trip. Um, the, we usually landed in Madrid and then uh, the trucks took us to Barcelona. And I was uh, told by the curator that the, uh, I was to be greeted by an official delegation. This was out of the blue. I had no warning about this. The mayor of Barcelona had decided that he would come and watch the opening of the crate and the unpacking just to welcome this favorite son, uh, uh, son's art, important artwork coming back to Barcelona. And that's what happened. The, in an hour or so, the mayor turned up in very formal attire with a tall silk hat, striped pant trousers, and he had three or four members of his delegation all in tall hats and striped trousers, and they came and made an official welcoming speech to the painting, and I guess, and to thank me for bringing it, and uh, then 
watch it carefully. Uh, and there were journalists there who were photographing every step of the way while we unpacked the painting. And then uh, I examined it closely with the uh, conservator in the, the Barcelona conservator. And we did appear on the front page of the paper the next morning. So, uh, you know, it's just that I was in my grubby travel clothes and not very wide awake. So I, I had wished that I had had some warning, but I was reminded in, in seeing uh, this uh, slide when I was getting uh, slides together for this talk that the, I had been warned in advance when I brought the Vermeer to the Rijksmuseum that there would be um, press there to record the, this beautiful painting's uh, arrival um, at the Rijksmuseum for the show. And uh, you can see the microphone there on the right. Uh, and they did record uh, and uh, photograph uh, our inspection of the painting uh, prior to hanging. And we did appear also in the local paper, but we were not on the front page this time. So at the, uh, at the when the courier arrives at the borrowing museum as here, the courier not only checks carefully the condition of the painting, as I've said, but they also have every right to check the premises where the temporary exhibition will be held, where the painting is to be hang. Uh, the courier checks for environmental safety and for the cleanliness and uh, of the temporary exhibition space. It has happened that some spaces were not quite ready for our arrival and there would be dust in the air still paint maybe painters were quickly painting the walls so if there was dust and paint splatters around the courier had every right to um, say uh, to just refuse to allow the crate to be opened until the area was clean and safe for the um, for the uh, painting to be brought out I'll just mention briefly the camaraderie also of courier trips. Here's an image from our, one of my trips to the Hermitage in um, uh, what was then Leningrad in uh, the Soviet Union in the late 1980s. Um, sometimes there would be large shipments just from the National Gallery and in order to spread out the value uh, on each shipment, there would uh, the, the paintings would travel on different flights so that if something happened, to one flight, the whole lot wouldn't be lost. Uh, so that I might meet up with uh, my colleagues from the National Gallery at the Destination Museum, or um, there could be a big show where colleagues from many other museums were lending paintings and their couriers were arriving. And I'd often meet uh, colleagues that I had gotten to know over time or uh, get to know new colleagues. That was always a fun part of courier trips. Some borrowing museums would host a wonderful meal uh, when many couriers were there at the same time. And I must admit, I've had many a delightful two hour long lunch with uh, colleagues in Italy or Spain. Uh, they have a very long working day. They would start work at about eight in the morning, then stop for lunch at one and we'd have a beautiful lunch. And then we'd start up work at three or something and go on until quite late in the evening. So it, we were not shirking our duties, <laughs> but uh, some of this, and, and we've been royally, I've been royally entertained in many places during this travel, which has always been a delight. So now I've covered some of these procedures of courier trips and shipping art, uh, and you've got a general idea of the various steps of the trips. I can recount a few stories to show you how trips often did not meet the norm. The most unusual venue uh, probably that I went to as a courier, several venues uh, involved uh, trips for this uh, large exhibition that took place in the National Gallery in uh, the 19, mid 1980s called the Treasure Houses of Great Britain. This is the catalog from the exhibition. The, I discussed this trip a bit in my December talk, so I won't go into detail here, but uh, just to mention that, um, that the gallery borrowed about 600 great works of art, furniture and decorative arts from, the, um, from these country houses, the most famous of the country houses in Britain and brought them together to the National Gallery in Washington for a big exhibition that lasted almost six months. And they reconstructed a lot of the rooms, the famous displays from the country houses in Washington in the National Gallery. So uh, a lot of uh, very elaborate arrangements were involved. Uh, British moving companies headed out to all the country houses over a period of several weeks. Each 
truck <clears throat> accompanied by a National Gallery uh, courier and arriving with pre-measured crates to pick up the art. And then the same, uh, then the art was shipped back down or driven back down in the trucks to warehouses in, um, in London. And then when there are enough crates gathered together, they were sent via Heathrow and Kennedy Airport down to the National Gallery in Washington, always accompanied by a courier. Uh, I was lucky to be able to get to um, behind the scenes of many country estates during these, these courier trips. On, uh, I went to several for this Treasure Houses show. Um, and some of the places, of course, were not open to the public, which was even uh, more special. Here's just one example. This is a scene of our moving our packing truck being uh, waiting outside uh, Arundel Castle, which was a, um, a wonderful castle-like um, country house. It's the restored ancestral homes of the Dukes of Norfolk and is down near the south coast of England, sort of southwest of London in West Sussex. We were returning, this, is, this was a return trip, not a pickup trip, but we were returning several items. Here you see a, uh, the, a large crate of a very heavy oak, 17th century oak chest. But what especially interested me um, for this talk were these two large portraits. Of, these are by Daniel Mytens, who was a very important uh, portraitist, a Dutch painter from the early part of the 17th century, um, who was uh, very much favored by the uh, country lords uh, of this period. Uh, and he, the portraits are of the original owners of Arundel Castle, Thomas Howard and his wife, Alethea Talbot. Um, and these paintings, however, were, uh, they're a matched pair. They are over seven feet tall and four feet wide, and they had heavy frames on them. And uh, they just uh, did not fit. Uh, the, the crates couldn't fit into the small openings of the uh, this, the small approaches to the castle. So the way it had, they had to be moved from the truck to the castle was by a tractor. The, uh, the, one of the groundskeepers came with his tractor and the crates were loaded onto the back of the um, tractor uh, into this cart. And um, the cart then tootled along uh, up a very windy approach to the castle, getting across the moat. And I was walking closely behind to make sure that they um, that everything went smoothly. And this happened several times during these uh, treasure houses uh, trips. Here is another a typical rehanging of a painting after its return uh, from the show at the National Gallery. This isn't Arundel Castle. This is Goodwood House, which um, was the ancestral <coughs> home, the, the county seat of the Dukes of Richmond, not far from Arundel Castle. And they had lent two beautiful Canaletto scenes um, painted by Canaletto for the original Dukes of Richmond back in the uh, 18th century. Uh, here you see the rehanging. We were, as the truckers and I were responsible for making sure that we uh, followed the wishes of the owners and uh, made sure the paintings were back in their original location if necessary. So uh, it was sometimes a pretty rickety job. Luckily, there's usually staff at these country houses and they helped with the rehanging. They're the ones at the very top of this ladder and the, our truckers are down below. Here's uh, one of the Canalettos, the one of the pair that we were bringing back. It's a, a, a exquisite painting painted while the great Italian scene painter Cataletta, Cataletta was working in uh, England. Now moving away from England and the Treasure Houses exhibition, I'll mention another very atypical, but rather regular location for picking up or bringing back loans and that was Venice. I spoke about Venice, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, this is a typical scene from the uh, the uh, packing and unpacking inside one of the British treasure houses. We were usually located in a grand salon and uh, we were always, our work was always uh, watched over by the ancestors of the, uh, of the present owners of the house. So that was, and I was usually given a tour, a nice tour by the housekeeper or the owner, depending on who was uh, dealing with us. And uh, we were often invited to tea 
And if we weren't, the, it was funny to me that the packers usually uh, hinted loudly that they would like their tea, please. And because my uh, being a tea drinker, not a coffee drinker, I thought this is a very civilized place to be. <laughs> Now, getting back to Venice, as I've mentioned, arriving at the loading dock in the, at the Grand Canal in Venice was quite a wonderful but hair-raising experience. We usually, again, were rather tired arriving uh, by truck from the airport in Milan because the Venice airport wasn't big enough to cope with our large crates. Here you see a typical uh, arrangement of the derrick bringing trucks uh, bringing the crates outside the truck and swinging them over into the barge. Uh, since everything in Venice is accessible only by water, the paintings, the crates had to be brought to the museums by barge. Those are three of my colleagues there, uh, uh, also watching their works that had arrived at the airport at the same time as the National Gallery crates. Here is uh, Here I am watching a crate being swung out. I always had to tell myself that the Venetian <clears throat> Uh, art handlers had been doing this kind of work for centuries. So they were much more used to swinging art in crates around than I was. And I really don't know what I could have done if something had gone wrong, but anyway, it was uh, hair raising to watch. But once that had happened and we were sitting in our barge, it, it, you can see this wonderful experience of uh, tootling up the Grand Canal. You can see one of my colleagues there sitting in the front of the boat. It was like suddenly, being transported into a different world with all the palaces of Venice watching as we traveled along. We were um, often escorted by the police depending on what the loan uh, contract required. Uh, and here, I just love this uh, image of the packed barge going underneath the Rialto Bridge uh, with the uh, a, a gondola uh, moving along in front of us. And then finally, this is a bridge in the Canareggio section of uh, Venice. You see one of the packed uh, boats, uh, barges going uh, ahead of ours. I'm surprised actually that the crates there are lying flat. If um, they, none of those are the blue National Gallery crates, but I, I don't think I would have allowed them to travel flat like this. But anyway, I do love this bridge because the National Gallery has a uh, painting by the Canaletto Contemporary Guardi uh, which depicts the same bridge in a much more romantic way. So it was always fun to, for me to, to be uh, traveling along under that bridge by barge. Another set of images uh, from Venice, just to give you an idea of some of the issues, uh, that big blue crate you see on, loaded on the barge at the center right uh, was a huge Tintoretto that had, we had loaned to the Academia Museum, which is the white building to the upper left. Uh, this was the biggest painting I've ever traveled with. It's a, a Tintoretto about 15 feet long by eight feet tall, the crate was. This is the actual painting. It's not, a, to me, to my way of thinking, a very beautiful painting, but it was critical for the exhibition that um, was being shown at the, um, at the Academia. It's quite a lovely Madonna portrait anyway. Uh, anyway, the, this... Uh, was again, very nerve wracking to be watching this kind of loading. The packers had to get the belts from the derrick underneath the uh, heavy crate first. And actually part of the very hair raising aspect of this was watching the crate being brought down the marble steps from the upstairs gallery uh, uh, location where the exhibition had been. The crate was uh, brought horizontally down the steps by about 12 uh, art handlers. And that I was almost more nervous about that than watching it being swung into the barge because this, uh, uh, I was so worried that they might, one or two of them might just let go and it would slide all the way down the steps. And here it is successfully being loaded into the barge and ready. We're soon to head out to the lovely palaces of, of Venice. Then I mentioned another unusual uh, courier trip was that to the Soviet Union in the very late uh, 1980s. This was the period of perestroika when Gorbachev and the, and the Soviet Union were making cultural, many cultural overtures to the West. This was still before the wall came down, but it was that period of opening up. I, around that time, I took about three courier trips to uh, Russia to the Hermitage here, which you see the entrance area with beautiful 
incredibly ornate museum. Um, and I, I think two to the Hermitage and one, to, one or two to Moscow, the museums there. Um, and one trip I took to the Hermitage was with a large group of in, Impressionist paintings again. Uh, interestingly, we did not ship the paintings directly to an airport in Leningrad or Moscow. At that time, we were very uncertain about the conditions at the airport, whether they were used to handling um, big, fragile shipments, um, <clears throat> art shipments. And we had a very reliable art moving company in Helsinki, a Finnish art moving company. And so the uh, courier and the crates would travel from Kennedy to Frankfurt. Uh, there was no direct route to Helsinki, but then they'd be transferred to a small freighter flight in, uh, in uh, Frankfurt. And I, in this case, for these Impressionist paintings, I was allowed to sit up right behind the pilot. I remember this was again in the late 1980s. I suspect with security issues nowadays, I wouldn't be allowed to do that, but it, it was fascinating to be right up there in front and look out the, out the windows of the plane. Uh, and then from uh, in Helsinki, the, uh, the pallets would be offloaded into the moving company's trucks, the art moving company's trucks. I would get in the cab and we would head off to the Russian border. And there, uh, the art stayed in the same trucks, but I would be moved from the cab to a, in a, a security car, a little car um, that, uh, uh, that the Russians used to lead the caravan of art trucks. And in this case, for the Impressionist show, I remember the car, the lead car was a tiny little Volkswagen bug. And I was put in the front seat with, and there were three <clears throat> hefty uh, young Russian soldiers with me in the bug. And they all had Kalashnikovs over their shoulders. Uh, I have no idea how we all fit into that little car, but on top of the car was a loudspeaker. And, uh, this was at the Russian border that I would get into this little car and the, um, the border crossing could be relatively easy or could take hours. It just somehow, we don't know why it would depend on the mood or the politics of the time. I have no idea, but eventually uh, with the impressionist paintings, we set off into the Russian forests uh, that were uh, between the border and Leningrad and the, uh, we roared along quite quickly. There was almost nobody, no traffic on the road, but whenever we would come up, come up behind a little farmer in his cart and vehicle, the, uh, one of the soldiers would yell out something on the loudspeaker on top of the a truck and the little cart and farmer would veer off the road into the ditch while we went roaring by. So it was always quite exciting. And again, remember it was pre, pre the wall coming down. So Russia was still a rather mysterious place, certainly to me. But when we got to the Hermitage, uh, we would be very beautifully received and um, there was incredible hospitality among the curators and conservators who actually didn't have a lot to entertain us with, but did it beautifully. Here you see um, another image of the unpacking area at the Hermitage. Uh, and uh, again, uh, there were several American couriers uh, convening at the same time. The, as I remember, the red crates are the Metropolitan Museum's crates. There are couriers there from the Baltimore Museum, the another National Gallery courier. And um, uh, it, there was always a lot of waiting in Russia, long hours of waiting because they did everything by hand. You see there was not uh, electricity handy. You can see from the looks of these couriers' faces how tired everybody is waiting and waiting. This is the crates up in the facilities up in the galleries of the Hermitage um, being opened little by little. We were um, always assigned a guide uh, when we wanted to travel to walk around the city uh, in those days. Um, that was kind of a watchdog guide for us. And finally, to come full circle with this talk, I'll return to the Japanese exhibition. I talked about the exhibition of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist um, paintings at the National Gallery first sent to Houston and then to the National Arts Center in Tokyo, and then the Municipal, Municipal Museum of Art in Kyoto. The, uh, I started this lecture with a uh, mention of this show. Uh, here you see uh, our, the National Gallery's Manet, Gar Saint-Lazare, on the back uh, cover of the brochure that I showed you in the beginning. 
uh, again, a wonderful combination of images. Uh, the National Gallery had closed down our uh, French 19th century spaces for renovation. You can see the closed doors there on the, the closed entries on the left. Uh, and in order to not keep the most popular part of the gallery's collection uh, off of view for a long time, it was arranged that 50 of the most popular of the uh, impressionist and post-impressionist paintings travel um, around on this exhibition, first to Houston and then to the two venues in Japan. Uh, some conservation was carried out on the paintings prior to shipment. Uh, here you can see my staff member Anne removing a yellow varnish from uh, Renoir's little girl, uh, famous little portrait of this little girl. And she uh, uh, actually did not go on the show. She, on, on the tour, she was part of a small group of impressionists that were shown downstairs in the National Gallery to allow the local uh, audience to still keep seeing some of their favorite paintings. And here's just shows you how yellow uh, varnish can make a painting look that uh, pale pink space over on the near the right center edge is where the yellow varnish has been removed from the painting. And it just shows you how yellow that yellow can really detract from the sparkling colors that are so typical of the Impressionists. Going back now to Japan, here's just a few images of the hanging of our um, paintings in Kyoto and Tokyo. Here's, um, this is a classic courier scene. Uh, one of my co-couriers, the Sally, the chief registrar from the gallery is uh, watching it all carefully. Um, a painting is just, I think that's Cezanne's um, painting of his father. And here uh, she's again watching carefully how the Manet Garcin Lazare is being hung. And to the left, you see the curator and the conservator in charge of the show watching the procedure as well. And finally, you get to see the Van Gogh with which I started the uh, talk out being hung uh, finally at its destination. Van Gogh, again, being a favorite with the Japanese audience. So that's just about the end of my talk, but I'll just mention that I learned while preparing this talk that courier travel is a really hot topic in museums right now. It accounts for, as you can imagine, a huge percentage of the cost of any uh, in any museum's exhibition budget. Somebody told me it was 80% of the exhibition budget is for courier travel. And because again of COVID ra raising its ugly head with all the um, uh, museums not uh, receiving income from uh, ticket sales and uh, nothing from um, bookshops and stores, museum shops, the, their budgets are way low and they're trying to save money. There have been all sorts of suggestions such as virtual couriers, um, bookend couriers, a courier at each end, but nobody traveling with the art and other options are going to be discussed. There'll be a panel meeting, um, big panel discussion at the uh, annual meeting of conservators in May, the National uh, Conservators Group will be discussing this. So you'll see, we'll see whether um, what the decision is. Most registrars and, and uh, conservators adamantly feel that this is the most effective way courier travel is to make sure uh, that paintings arrive safely and are watched every step of the way. And insurance companies so far agree with that. So we shall see what develops. And you, you may have been watching stories about um, something that will no longer exist. I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. My gosh, the imagery of um, just the, the, some of the, the, some of the travels. Um, I mean, the image of you in the Volkswagen with the three burly, um, <laughs> Kalashnikov carrying Russian soldiers was um, just amazing. Um, thank you for sharing those experiences. We have some questions. Um, first of all, I want to say hello from uh, Nina Rothwells. That's uh -huh. to you. And uh, let's see. Um, on on that on that original, going back to the beginning of your um, talk, there was a painting by Rembrandt that you shared. Um, and someone's, is, someone's asking if that was not actually a Rembrandt self-portrait. 
Uh, yes, they actually, it, it has much has been discussed. It used to be called the Polish nobleman. It still is, uh, but there is much speculation that it is a self-portrait. It certainly looks like Rembrandt. Hmm. Great, thank you. And and how many couriers traveled at a time? I think you might have addressed this in, in your talk. This was an early question. Um, there is no set rule. It just depends uh, on what is traveling. There can just be one courier um, traveling as, as I did with the Miro, um, the f image of the farm, the painting the farm. Uh, or um, there can be, at least from one institution, or there can be uh, five or six couriers from the same institution traveling with art. Um, I can't really assess how many couriers in general uh, all around the world are traveling at one time. I, I'm not sure if that's what the questioner was asking. Yes, I know it's not, it doesn't seem to be specific. So if there, if, to the questioner, if you if you wanted to be more specific, please put it into the chat, and we can we can kind of get to it again. Because um, I'm just kind of there's some really good questions, and they're coming in from all different angles. Um, so uh, so we'll just take them as as they've come in. Uh, another question is where at the hotel were paintings kept while waiting for the next step? Oh, the. Um the paintings were never kept in the hotel. They were always delivered first to the receiving museum and they would be waiting there. Then you would be taken to your hotel. The courier would go to his or her hotel, uh, stay overnight and then turn up at the hotel at a, I mean, at the uh, museum at a preset time the next day to uh, watch the unpacking of the paintings. So they were never ever at a hotel. And today, would a good digital photograph be a better substitute for personal examination by a courier? And what would a courier see that a photo might miss? A, a courier can see three-dimensional things. There, there might be flaking, for example. Um, a area of the paint might be lifting that would not be visible even in a good digital photograph. It's the, the three-dimensional issues that I think are, are not very clear in digital photography, but it's something that's being discussed of all sorts of virtual ways of replacing human couriers with are, are being looked at. But that, my feeling is that uh, you wouldn't see a lot of the three-dimensional issues if you uh, used um, a good digital photograph. Uh, another question coming in. At Colby, some paintings lent for a show had to be cleaned on arrival. How often must loans be cleaned, uh, for example, furniture as well? It's very rare. Uh, a museum usually does not want the, um, the art, their own art being touched by other uh, non, they're not their own staff members. Sometimes the courier from the museum traveling with the art might uh, do a little touch up or something if a flake was lost in a frame or, um, but if something is loaned from a private owner, um, it can be that uh, the, um, then there is some arrangement whereby, especially with furniture, they might be dusted. I, I would understand that, but uh, most um, museums wouldn't allow the art or the decorative art of the sculpture to be touched. Uh, that way when it arrived at its location. Has there ever been damage or theft of artworks during such transits? I don't know of any theft. I think I mentioned that briefly. I, I don't know of any um, thieves there. I could be, I've missed something, but uh, I've never heard of it in my, in the national gallery circles in New York and all, I haven't heard of it. Um, damage has happened. Um, Things like sometimes a, a, a frame is a little more fragile than expected and a piece of the frame will, a tiny piece of a frame can fall out inside the packing and scratch the surface of a painting. I remember that happened once. Uh, with object, objects, shipping of objects is much more difficult. Uh, these fragile marble sculptures that came from uh, Britain for 
um, the British Treasure Houses exhibition, they, they have to be extremely carefully packed. There are special foam arrangements all around the objects so that they don't budge. And so, uh, yeah, the, a minor damage has happened um, in transit. I didn't, I had to delete some information, but it has happened too that forklifts have gone through crates and uh, when they were moving them in the cargo warehouses and gone through the bottom of a crate and damaged a painting that way. Uh, but I decided not to include that. <laughs> I mean, it's probably bad enough. I mean, I could feel you cringing, you know, in the photograph, watching those slings going underneath the crates and moving them onto the gondolas and wow. <laughs> it's um, yeah, I can imagine. And so there's a question here which might have been answered, but it, it does um, address the insurance piece. So if damage occurs, how is it addressed by whom? And I think you might have kind of covered that, but is there an overarching international insurance coverage such as Lloyd's of London? Well, it, it just depends. Uh, each arrangement for each exhibition is different. The um, most uh, art traveling for big US exhibitions is covered by the a government indemnity. And that uh, otherwise the costs would be way too high for individual museums to, um, to cover. So uh, I, I know of the, I'm not, not, I'm not sure with international uh, museums and entities how they're insured, but uh, yes, they, there is government indemnity for uh, most uh, American shipments. And the process is complicated. I, uh, we used to have to call our, if something happened to a painting, we would call back to, the, to our museum back home and uh, report the uh, damage. I've never had any large damage, but if there was a scratch, they would give permission for us to do a little uh, retouching. If a conservator is the courier, then the conservator can repair tiny damages. Um, it's, more common, I suppose, if ornate furniture and pieces are traveling that they might have little uh, damages, um, but I, I'm not that knowledgeable about those. Mm -hmm. Does the courier stay with the work of art for the whole exhibition time? And if so, does the courier regularly check on the piece during the exhibit? Usually not. The courier goes home immediately. Our courier trips to Europe, we were allowed three nights there and once the painting is securely on the wall, that's what the insurance requires. Once it's, it's like from wall to wall, once you have seen it safely on the wall, then the insurance of the borrowing museum takes over and no, the courier does not have to uh, stay, uh, does not stay. There have been special exceptions. I remember that our National Gallery um, borrowed um, the Leonardo da Vinci from the Krakow Museum, um, the lady with a uh, ermine, and that was a huge deal. I don't think Krakow had ever lent it before and not for an extended period. And, and the, then the Krakow Museum required that their conservators live <laughs> in Washington, stay with the painting, uh, check on it every day wow. for three months. <laughs> that oh, was a little unusual. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Does the receiving museum, oops, where did that go? Um, hold on, my, my thing just scrolled up on me. Does okay. the receiving museum do some cost sharing for the piece and the couriers travel or recompense the, recompensate, I guess, recompense the sending museum in some way? Yes, yeah, they, there is, uh, each loan arrangement is different, but they're usually, is some sort of sharing, cost sharing arrangement. I, I'm not that expert on those things. So I'm, I'm not the person to ask our registrar's office and the exhibitions office were in charge of those things. So yes, but there were always uh, different um, expense arrangements, sharing, cost sharing that would go on. How about um, what, how decisions are made about what to loan and then um, the question continues, please discuss the, the tension of weighing the revenue from loaning works against satisfying the interests of visitors to see treasured works from the home collection. Well, uh, yes, the, I, I think the questioner is asking, for example, the impressionist paintings that we sent out on loan, uh, those were, beloved paintings in the National Gallery. And it was very 
hard, we would usually never send that many of them out on tour. But because it was just an exceptional situation where the um, galleries had to be closed down for renovation. So <clears throat> this tour was cooked up and I just, I don't know the financial arrangements. I think the Japanese spend a lot of money on, on the tour also, but um, so yeah, it, it was always a balance deciding. And again, that really wasn't my purview deciding whether to take something like the Vermeer off of view for three months uh, to have it uh, be part of an important um, exhibition in the Rijksmuseum. And usually the curator and the director and all had to make those decisions. Do you know of any instance where the painting or a painting has been damaged during travel and what happens at that point? Um, well, if, if the, uh, for example, I, I have never been involved in one where, there, where a, um, a forklift went through a crate, but I can imagine then the, the painting would just have to be uh, de taken out of the exhibition. They, they, it obviously, it not, that, that could not be repaired in a quick repair. If it was just a surface scratch that was caused by debris inside the crate, then um, the conservator, if the, con the courier was a conservator, they could do the repair. Um, I, I think with the treasure houses exhibition, when there were complex furniture pieces and um, decorative arts, if uh, sometimes a piece might have fallen off and then uh, especially on the return and, and then they would be repaired by the local uh, restorer in the uh, in near the country house. So it just each case is different. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there were reports to the insurance companies, but I don't actually know how that worked. Was there a courier for each painting or would a courier be responsible for several paintings? The, a courier would re, be responsible for several paintings. Usually, again, they divided the shipments up related to value. I had noted uh, in my notes as I was preparing for this talk that my shipment of paintings from Houston to the Tokyo museum was worth $98 million on one pallet, which is an incredibly high value usually, but the impressionists are just so valuable and, and post-impressionists like our friend Van Gogh here that, um, that they could not make small enough shipments. They would have had to have too, too many couriers. So uh, yeah, <laughs> so um, usually there were a lot of couriers if there were high values. Do you use gadgets to monitor G-forces on the crates? And, and what is the maximum G-force a painting usually has to endure on a journey from jostling boat movement, et cetera? I, uh, that, again, I'm sorry, that's not quite my expertise. I, there were there have many testing devices have been placed in crates to test the forces that the painting is undergoing. Um, for a long time, it was very popular to uh, carry small pieces by hand, hand carry uh, works of art on um, uh, next to you in a seat. Uh, say if I were traveling with that Vermeer, it would be in a small crate next to me on the seat. But early on, uh, those kinds of tests measuring the, the forces, um, uh, the shock and vibration on a painting in a crate found that hand carried paintings underwent much more shock and vibration than paintings uh, that were shipped on a pallet in a cargo uh, warehouse via tr and truck and uh, plane. So uh, that really discouraged uh, at least us from uh, sending things hand carried. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a good question. That's been extensively studied, but I, I don't know the specific data on that. Mm, thank you. Oh, if a courier is taken ill, who substitutes? Is this the sort of thing that adds cost? Yes, I, I'm trying to think of an instance where a courier actually got sick in transit. I, um, sometimes, you know, you, you don't feel too well, you eat something that doesn't agree with you, but I, I've never known of one having to be replaced, but yeah, usually the, Lending Museum would send over another courier to replace the sick person, and um, that would increase the costs. Yes, it certainly would. 
but I can't in my experience remember at the moment any incidents of that. I just have a couple more questions. Um, did any of the works, oh, I think we did answer that. Did any of the works need conservation after arriving and prior to opening of the exhibit? Anything, yes. Anything yeah. that traveled with, yeah. Yeah. We, we answered that one. Yes, I, that does happen sometimes. And are most conservators women? Um, That's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, the majority of painting conservators have been usually women, yes. But um, uh, it's a funny distribution. Paper conservators are usually women, but objects conservators, uh, sculpture conservators are, um, there's a mixture, it's an equal distribution. But yeah, it tends to be a rather a female. Uh, it's the trite old thing about having fine finger um, coordination and all. It tends to um, appeal, or at least it tends to attract women more. And for couriers also, were most of your colleague, colleagues women? Uh, no, because uh, then the courier jobs were spread out, not just among conservators, but uh, the registrar's office, the um, curators. Um, so it's possibly uh, maybe 60% were women, but it just depended on whom, what other museums uh, were traveling and who uh, the registrars were often men. And it looked like from one of the images, Japan had men conservators or in the gallery. Those were, those were the art handlers. The art handlers, okay. Yeah, they were the art handlers. And those tend to be men. They're often artists who, at least at the National Gallery, who support their, their art by uh, working as art handlers during the day. And uh, they're usually a wonderfully experienced uh, group of people, at least at the gallery, they'd been there many years and were highly skilled as art handlers. But yeah, um, there were one or two women in uh, the National Gallery as art handlers, but it, it, that tends to have been men usually. I don't know why. Uh, well, thank you, Sarah. Th that's, um, that's all of the questions. We've got some really nice comments. Thank you for a pragmatic presentation with fabulous slides. Um, there was a, a Nina said um, something about a huge topic of debate in the conservation community. I'm not sure what, what that was related to, but um, I'm sure there are many different topics of debate within the conservation community that you might have touched on. Um, yeah, she might have been referring to this issue of couriers, whether it's a you know whether it's worth it to have couriers or not. Oh, uh, right. Well, this has just been a fascinating talk and I'm just so in awe of your knowledge and your expertise and, uh, and thank you for sharing it with us. And this will be recorded um, so you can go back in and, and uh, take a look, anyone in the, in the viewing audience, if you wanted to revisit. And um, I just wanna say thank you to our audience. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you to David Troop, my colleague, who's working backstage on the question and answers and the spotlighting for this program. And um, I'm hoping to see you again at some point soon with the upcoming lecture series. Um, we'll have um, Talisia Fleming from the Smithsonian speaking in May. And we have upcoming programs. You can check out the website. We have some excellent exhibitions opening soon. And uh, I just wanna thank everyone for being on the line today. And uh, thank you again, Sarah, for this really awesome presentation. I appreciate your thank time. You. Thank you, thank you right. very much. Have a good right, day. Bye -bye, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Have a good day, everybody. We'll bye. say bye. Yeah, have a great <laughs> day, everyone. Take care bye. and come and visit. Bye.